My name is Stuart Scott, I'm one of the trainers here at Cloud Academy, specialising in AWS, Amazon Web Services. Before we can understand how this service can be used to run and scale your code, we first need to understand what the service is exactly. AWS Lambda is a serverless compute service which has been designed to allow you to run your application code without having to manage and provision your own EC2 instances. This saves you having to maintain and administer an additional layer of technical responsibility within your solution. Instead, that responsibility is passed over AWS to manage for you. If you don't need to spend time operating, managing, patching and securing an EC2 instance, then you have more time to focus on the code of your application and its business logic, while at the same time optimising costs. With AWS Lambda, you only ever have to pay for the compute power when Lambda is in use via Lambda functions, and I shall explain more on these later. AWS Lambda charges compute power per 100 milliseconds of use, only when your code is running, in addition to the number of times your code runs. With sub-second metering, AWS Lambda offers a truly cost-optimized solution for your serverless environment. So how does it work? Well, there are essentially four steps to its operations. Firstly, AWS Lambda needs to be aware of your code that you need to run, so you can either upload this code to AWS Lambda or write it within the code editors that Lambda provides. Currently, AWS Lambda supports Node.js, Python, Java, c -sharp, Go, and also Ruby. It's worth mentioning that the code that you write or upload can also include other libraries. Once your code is within Lambda, you then need to configure Lambda functions to execute your code upon specific triggers from supported event sources, such as S3. As an example, a Lambda function could be triggered when an S3 event occurs, such as an object being uploaded to an S3 bucket. Once the specific trigger is initiated during your normal operations of AWS, AWS Lambda will run your code as per your Lambda function, using only the required compute power as defined. Later in this course, I will cover more on when and how this compute power is specified. AWS records the compute time in milliseconds and the quantity of Lambda functions run to ascertain the cost of the service. The Lambda service itself can be found within the AWS Management Console under the Compute category, as remember, Lambda is providing a compute function for your code to run on. For an AWS Lambda application to operate, it requires a number of different elements, so I just want to take a few minutes to explain what each of these are. The following form the key constructs of a Lambda application. The Lambda function. The Lambda function is compiled of your own code that you want Lambda to invoke as per the defined triggers. Event sources. Event sources are AWS services that can be used to trigger your Lambda functions. Or put another way, they produce the events that your Lambda function essentially responds to by invoking it. For a comprehensive list of these event sources, please see the following link. Downstream resources. These are the resources that are required during the execution of your Lambda function. For example, your function might call upon accessing a specific SNS topic or a particular SQS queue. So they are not used as the source of the trigger, but instead they are the resources to be used to execute the code within the function upon invocation. Log streams. In an effort to help you identify issues and troubleshoot issues with your Lambda function, you can add logging statements to help you identify if your code is operating as expected into a log stream. These log streams would essentially be a sequence of events that all come from the same function and are recorded in CloudWatch. In addition to log streams, Lambda also sends common metrics of your functions to CloudWatch for monitoring and alerting. The Lambda function is compiled of your own code that you want Lambda to invoke as per the defined triggers. But how is a function created and how do I upload my code? What else is involved with the creation of a Lambda function and is there more to it than that? Prior to creating your function, you need to have some code to add to it. After all, that's a fundamental element of your function. Once you have successfully written your code, you are ready to import it into Lambda and this is achieved by creating a deployment package. This deployment package will either be a zip or a jar file and will contain your code and any dependent libraries required. How you create these deployment packages are very dependent on the programming language that you decide to use within your function. 
For details on how to create these packages, please use the following URL links respectively. Once your deployment package has been created, you will need to modify the permissions against your zip file. This is because Lambda needs global read permissions on the code and any dependent libraries that you have also included within the package. If the permissions are not set correctly, then there is a chance that the Lambda function may fail on execution. AWS provides a really good example of how to check and correct the permissions of your deployment package file, which can be found here. It explains that if you are using Linux, Unix, then you can use zipinfo to check the permissions by running the following command against your package. The dash r and subsequent dashes indicates that these files are only readable by the file owner. As a result, your Lambda function could fail as they are not set with global read permissions. To rectify this and to set the correct permissions for AWS Lambda, you can run the following commands. The first command will ensure that the files in the temp package contents location will have read write permissions to the owner, in addition to the read permissions to group and global. The second command simply pushes these same permissions down in all other directories. The result of these commands means that the permissions will look as follows for your package. If you are running the Windows OS, then it is recommended that you use 7-zip for Windows instead of zip info. To download 7-zip, please visit the following link. If you were to write your code from within Lambda itself, then Lambda would create these deployment packages for you. If authoring your code outside of Lambda, and you are now in a position of having your code written and packaged, next you will need to upload it to the service. This can be done from within the AWS console, the CLI, or the SDKs. So let me clarify what an event source is and what an event source mapping is. An event source is an AWS service that produces the events that your Lambda function responds to by invoking it. For a comprehensive list of these event sources, please see the following URL. Event sources can either be poll or push based. At the time of writing this course, the current poll based event sources are Amazon Kinesis, Amazon SQS and DynamoDB. When using these services as an event source, Lambda actually polls the service looking for particular events. For example, Lambda will poll the message queue for SQS, and then Lambda will synchronously invoke the associated function when a matching event is found. Push-based event sources cover all the remaining supported event sources. Services using this push model publish events in addition to actually invoking your Lambda function. That's one of the key differences. The event source service invokes the function instead of Lambda, which is what happens for poll-based event sources. Event source mappings. Simply put, an event source mapping is the configuration that links your event source to your Lambda function. It's what links the events generated from your event source to invoke your Lambda function. However, depending on if the event source is push or poll based determines where this event source mapping is configured and stored. Thankfully, monitoring statistics related to your Lambda function within CloudWatch is by default already configured. This also includes monitoring your functions as they are running. CloudWatch has the following metrics that are automatically populated by Lambda. Invocations. This determines how many times a function has been invoked and will match the number of build requests that you are charged. Errors. This metric counts the number of failed invocations of the function, for example, the result of a permissions error. Dead letter errors. This counts the number of times Lambda failed to write the dead letter queue, for example, due to misconfigured resources or permission issues. Duration. This metric simply measures how long the function runs for in milliseconds, from the point of invocation to when it terminates its execution. Again, used for billing, however, Lambda build requests are measured in per 100 millisecond timeframes. Throttles. This is a count as to how many times the function was invoked and throttled due to the limit of concurrency having been reached. Iterate age. This is only used for stream-based invocations, such as Amazon Kinesis. It measures in time how long Lambda took to receive a batch of records to the time of the last record written to the stream. This iterator age is measured in milliseconds. Concurrent executions. This is a combined metric for all of your Lambda functions that you have running within your AWS account, in addition to functions with a custom concurrency limit. It calculates the total sum of concurrent executions at any point in time. Unreserved concurrent executions. 
Again, this is also a combined metric for all of your functions in your account, and it calculates the sum of concurrency of functions without a custom concurrency limit at any given time. By utilizing these metrics that are published into CloudWatch, you are able to maintain an overview of your functions and if you are experiencing any unexpected errors. Using the features of CloudWatch, you can easily create a dashboard relating to your functions. For more information on CloudWatch and how to configure the service to get the most from your metrics, please see our existing course here. Common issues as to why your function might not run relate to permissions, and you should check your IAM role execution policy and function policies to ensure the correct access has been issued to run your function. Now we have a clear understanding of what is required, let's get started with the training.